All right. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to another program with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got a new, familiar, an unfamiliar crowd in the audience today. And so if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Everything we do goes to YouTube Live and stays there forever. So if you want to watch this program in three years or 30 years down the road, you can absolutely go back and do just that. Uh, today, too, marks the second program of a seven-part amazing series in conjunction with our friends at the Gairdner Foundation. So every year, we get the amazing opportunity to partner with Gairdner and their incredible laureates highlighting the very best people in medical and biomedicine uh, health research around the globe. It's been a really wild ride. This week alone, we've got vaccines coming up later. We've got CRISPR, cancer therapeutics, brain science. Yesterday, we wrapped up with Dr. Bonnie Bassler talking about how bacteria talk. Again, all these programs are going to be on our YouTube channel if you want to follow up and learn from some of the coolest scientists on planet earth but i'm really thrilled today to bring you dr chris musquash so he is joining us in ontario today to talk about some of his amazing work as a health researcher with indigenous-led mental health research at uh, lakehead university and the northern ontario school of medicine university he's also a clinical psychologist so he's going to talk from sort of the dual angle of doing research on and getting to work firsthand with people that are having challenges so i'm really excited to bring him in for a very unique program we've never had anything quite like this on so Without further ado, Dr. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Good morning, Jesse. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I know you've got a lot to share with us, and I, I'm really excited for a Q&A later, so if you want to dive in, tell us a little bit about your career, how you got interested in this, what you do on a day-by-day -day basis, I think our audience would absolutely love to hear about it, and I'll pop in when you're uh, when you're done. Thanks, man. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Yeah, and... Um, Hello to everyone. Uh, thanks so much for, for being here and sharing some of your time uh, this morning with me. Um, really, really a great honor and privilege to be able to uh, tell you a little bit about some of the work that uh, that we do in collaboration with community, but also to tell you a little bit about uh, the process and journey uh, to uh, becoming a, uh, a researcher and a clinician. Um, so maybe a little bit about myself. I, I have a number of different uh, things that I do uh, day to day, um, but all of it kind of flows from uh, really trying hard to uh, uh, work with communities, work with people to improve systems and services um, when it comes to mental health and addiction in, 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 in Indigenous communities, but also rural uh, and Northern uh, communities in, in Ontario and in, in, in the rest of Canada. And so I, I always like to say that I, I sort of accidentally uh, became a bunch of things that I, I didn't know existed. And so uh, I grew up uh, in, in rural northwestern Ontario. Uh, if you're familiar at all with um, with, with Thunder Bay, uh, you'll know that we're sort of up on the North Shore of Lake Superior. I actually grew up about four and a half hours uh, northwest of there in a, in a small town called Sioux Lookout, uh, and, uh, and and sort of grew up doing you know all the small town things that, that we did. So you know played hockey and and hunted and spent time in the bush and and so on. Uh, and then had the opportunity to, to pursue some some things in, in, in university uh, and, and, and ended up finding myself in this position where um, where I was able to kind of do a bunch of different things with a bunch of different people and communities, all, again, aimed at, uh, at trying to improve systems and services and mental health addiction. And so, you know, when I grew up, you know, I didn't necessarily, I wasn't aware of any of the things that, that I'm doing now. I, I, I guess I may have had a sense that there were psychologists. I didn't really know that there were university professors. And I certainly didn't know that there were, uh, um, you know, uh, research administrators and so on in hospitals and, and, and chief scientists and some of these other titles that uh, that I've since uh, had the opportunity of, to, to, of trying out. Um, and so in that way, um, you know, I'm often asked, you know, how is it that you became a, a clinician and a researcher? And, and there's a lot of ways to answer that question. I mean, one way is to say, well, I went to school and I uh, took the courses I needed to, to take in order to become those things. And, and that's part of the story. But I think one of the reasons why it's, 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 it's important for me to, to kind of engage and talk with, talk with young people is that I think that, you know, you all have a tremendous amount of capacity and a tremendous amount of potential uh, and a tremendous amount that you, uh, that you have inherent to yourself is, is skills and, 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 things that you can you can do uh, and, and and I think sometimes it's the case that we don't always even know what, what those are um, because we've yet to sort of have the formative experiences or have the opportunities to really expand expand our 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 our, uh, our skill set and to learn new things and to be mentored and so in that way I always you know 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very thankful to, to our young people and, and the amount of creativity and brilliance and, 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 and potential that, that you all have. Um, and so in that way, I look forward again to engaging a little bit in the question and answer period uh, afterward. Um, but coming back uh, uh, for a second, when I think about, you know, how it is that we, how it is that I, I sort of, you know, found myself doing these things that I'm doing now, I really think it was it was around formative experiences growing up in, in, in rural and northern uh, Ontario. Um, you know, I spent time, uh, you know, on the land. I spent time learning skills and and, and, and being sort of um, being encouraged and, and, and sort of uh, tested, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, my ability to kind of carry myself and, 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 and do the things I needed to do to be competent uh, when I was on the land. Uh, when I was about six or seven years old, um, when I was hunting at one point, my, my dad actually sent me off, you know, on my own down this one, one, uh, one area where we used to, where we used to go. Um, and I was terrified and, you know, it took, it took us a number of different times of going back to that spot. And he, he kept sort of sending me on my own, uh, and, and by about the fifth or sixth or seventh time we were there, um, you know, I was able then to say, well, I'm, I'm going to go this way. And uh, I, I, at that point, had developed the comp confidence and, and, and the self-determination and the self-efficacy and all of these really important key uh, key parts of, 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 of an individual's ability to kind of take on a challenge on their own and see it through and, and sort of find out, you know, that you're able to do something that you maybe thought you weren't able to do. And so in that way, you know, as a bit of background, I was, I was, I was kind of an anxious kid. I, I was pretty physiologically anxious. I always had a sore stomach. I was you know, uh, had some, a lot of, a lot of uh, these types of anxieties. And, um, and I think that, you know, in, in that way, growing up, um, you know, that was, that was sort of the, the cultural treatment for anxiety was to, was to, 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 to give a young person the experiences that, that both kind of, uh, offered a little bit of stress that was reasonable. It wasn't, it wasn't overwhelming in the context of, uh, a close relationship, a supportive relationship, and uh, the knowledge that the other person who was who was uh, asking this of you had the belief that you'd be able to do it. And if you repeat that a number of times, then you know you learn. Well, why was I able to do that? And then when you fast forward through sort of academic careers, I, I, when I think about it, each of the each of the times where I've sort of been unsure as to whether or not I ought to proceed to the next thing or try try the new challenge. Uh, that lesson always comes back, that lesson that, you know, maybe I, maybe I have a capacity that I'm unaware of, of having at this point, and, and it's only through trying it and testing it and, and developing that confidence am I able to, to kind of move ahead. And, and when you look at, say, the evidence-based treatments for uh, mental health uh, challenges, um, you know, one of the common parts, uh, at least, of, of, of you know all of the things that tend to work in terms of helping people manage those difficulties uh, includes some level of, of of exposure to a to a challenging situation that you then learn to manage and you learn to to, to overcome but also you learn uh, that you have say more capacity than you than you thought maybe you had and so we do a lot of this just naturally in our in our lives i mean if anyone out there is a, is a, is a musician if anyone out there is an athlete or an artist or if anyone out there is a singer or, or any of these other, um, these other, you know, really, really important things that we do, uh, you'll know that the very first time you had a piano recital, you were probably pretty shaky about it. But by your 10th one or 15th one, you, you know, had, had some nerves perhaps, but you're able to go out and, and, and do that thing. We also know this when it comes to taking quizzes. We know this when it comes to taking tests and, uh, you know, doing assignments that, that we don't always know uh, what our capacity is. But that we have to kind of uh, uh, have the experience where we're we're put under that reasonable pressure in the context of a supportive relationship, such that we can find our way to the other side of it and and, and come away from that experience with, with with sort of a new skill. So in that way, um, again, you know, my pathway to becoming a psychologist and researcher really was was you know both what I learned in school, uh, but also what I learned on the land and what I learned sort of in my own. Um, cultural upbringing. Um, and so why that's relevant is that, you know, so much of my, 
my work since then and, and my, my collaborations with communities and, and, and grad students and trainees and, and, and colleagues and, and everyone else is really uh, in, in trying to understand and develop uh, approaches to helping people with mental health and addiction difficulties that take the very best of, of what we know from the psychological interventions that are appropriate, that are that are that have shared values when it comes to you know uh, indigenous ways of knowing, um, but also to take those cultural interventions um, that that we know uh, are also effective, and and help people um, have those experiences that that then allow them to um, to develop uh, new ways of of maybe you know, maybe doing things. Um, so I'm really, really curious then in research about sort of the, the mechanisms of action, let's say, like, what is it about the thing that, that makes it work? And I just, you know, started today with, with an example of that. It is, you know, the, 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 the experience of being exposed to something that, that might make you anxious, but then you have practice in overcoming, right? So I talked about that from a cultural perspective, um, but I also talked about that from an evidence-based psychological treatment perspective. And so because those two things are shared, uh, even though, you know, the way we go about doing it in, in a psychology office or a psychology clinic versus a, uh, um, a cultural experience on the land, those are very, very different ways of, of say, doing something. But they share the underlying thing about them that that's the thing that works. And in fact, you know, there are, um, you know, treatments for people when they are experiencing um, anxieties and other uh, things, and even in, in, in terms of uh, specific phobias that people might have, where part of the way of helping to address that is in, in a supportive way, have those experiences where you are exposed to some of those things that uh, in, in a safe way and in a voluntary way uh, that, that, that generate some anxiety. Then you allow that time to pass, you allow that anxiety to begin to settle, and then you go a little further. And we know that those are very, very effective uh, at uh, at helping people who have those difficulties. So um, it's in combining those early cultural experiences and experiences, you know, growing up rurally and, and being on the land with um, with the evidence base uh, and, and science uh, of, of, psych of psychological science and clinical science. Um, so in that way, you know, I find myself again, very, very fortunate, very, very lucky to be able to do the work that, uh, that I found myself doing. When it comes to research and clinical work, the stuff that I do is really very much driven by community needs. And so I work closely with communities. I work closely with organizational partners. I work closely with trainees. Um, and we really do our very, very best to, um, to, to undertake research that, that answers some type of question that's driven from the community. So for example, you know, we know that uh, our community partners were really, really curious about how difficult early life experiences might contribute to mental health difficulties and, and other challenges that people face as adults. And so it turns out that there's a, a, a literature, a research literature on this that's been um, accumulating since, you know, sort of the mid to late 1990s, um, but outside of, of, of the Indigenous community. Uh, so more in the, in the general, general population in, in the U.S. predominantly, but also uh, more recently in Canada. And so these questions uh, were being driven by our community partners, by leadership from our, our communities who were saying, you know, how can we understand this, um, you know, amongst our people? And so we worked very, very closely together uh, with people, uh, with our community partners, with our organizational partners to come up with a way of, of, of looking at this very, very carefully uh, through research. And what we found is that, that indeed, uh, for many of the adults that were, um, that are accessing services with, with, with our organization, our mental health organization. Um, a lot of people have had very, very difficult uh, early experiences that contribute to um, why it is they might find themselves um, kind of in a place where they're experiencing challenges and seeking help um, uh, in, in a way to kind of um, support them through those difficulties. So research, again, helps us answer those questions, but it also has allowed us to um, you know, engage with with clients of programs uh, to help them help clients understand uh, how these underlying experiences can contribute to what's going on now. Um, for a number of reasons, it, it helps people sort of make sense of 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 of, of their lives. Uh, it helps people find community, knowing that they're not the only ones who have experienced these these difficult um, 
times. Um, it also helps people to, to know uh, just exactly where to aim and, and the important things to, 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 to try and work on when it comes to the health of our own families, the health of our own children, uh, and the health of our communities more broadly. So it's really at that place where research and clinical uh, work uh, meet that so much of our community-based work is, uh, is, is sort of centered. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. And, and, and that's why, you know, the opportunity to, to, to speak with folks such as yourself is so important to me. Um, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, for everybody uh, when it comes to careers in psychology, careers in mental health, and so on. Uh, one of the things that I always liked about psychology was that um, if it involves people, uh, there is some psychological aspect uh, uh, that, 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 that is available for you to learn more about. And so when it comes to even clinical services, what you'll learn is that there are, are so many different opportunities to, to engage with, with people clinically uh, in all manner of areas. Uh, and what I mean by that is there are such things as as art therapy and music therapy and rec therapy and um, you know so if you're interested in sport or music or art or um, you know speech or um, the way the way uh, uh, people learn how to do things and so on that there there is some type of of clinical pathway clinical career available in that but there's also um, research opportunity as well. Um, and it, it's not always the pathway that you become a psychologist or you need to become a psychologist, although that's one pathway. But, you know, many of these other um, professions that deliver very, very important services to people who are experiencing difficulty um, um, don't necessarily have, uh, have to pursue, uh, you know, uh, PhDs or, or, or become psychologists. There's many different programs that allow you to develop those skills to kind of pursue that thing that you're really interested in, but to, to take those skills that you have and, um, and, and learn the clinical side of things to then be able to kind of contribute to, to services in, in, in some way. Um, so that's, that's, you know, one of my favorite things about, about psychology is that, you know, uh, you know, as long as it involves people, there's, um, there's a psychological aspect that, uh, that, uh, that you can use to like, you know, bring in all those things you're interested in and find a way of, 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 uh, using those, those things to, 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 to help other people. Um, and as well, there's a tremendous need. So not just because the need for services and supports for young people and adults is increasing, although we have seen in, in the last number of years an, an increase in the need that people have, but also, you know, similar to many other health professions, when it, when you come, when it comes to say medicine, nursing, psychology, and so on, it turns out that the, the workforce tends to be um, a little tipped toward um, people who are later in their careers. So as an example, um, you know, numbers that we looked at on looked at in Ontario uh, a couple of years ago suggested that around like right now there's about 4,000 clinical psychologists in Ontario. Um, but in five to 10 years, that number could be as low as 2,000 uh, because people uh, who are nearing their end of, the end of their careers will be retiring. And what that means is that there's a tremendous need, but also a tremendous opportunity for people to, to join the profession uh, and contribute in really, really important ways to our, to our health systems, to our, our clinical care and so on. So, you know, whenever you see a challenge like that, a challenge like, um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of people that are gonna be retiring. Um, what that also presents is, is an opportunity, an opportunity to train, an opportunity to grow the workforce um, amongst amongst young people like yourselves and such that um you know you you may be the ones who are who are leaders you know in in a relatively short period of time in, in say 10 or 15 years um and i think that's another one of the you know important lessons that uh that i've learned along the way is that you know in those cultural teachings that we have around understanding that we are individuals who are who exist in long lines of individuals people who came before us we have a responsibility to in terms of um, sharing the knowledge that we've, we've, we've gained from them, but also we, we, we exist in a long line of individuals that will, that will come after us um, in a, and have a responsibility to them as well. And, and I, I mean that even within professions. So me as a psychologist now, I'm responsible to you. Uh, if you would like to be a psychologist someday to help provide the training, help provide the mentorship, help 
help you find that pathway uh, into the profession such that um, when it's time for me to retire, I'll know that uh, I'll know that the clients uh, are in good hands because you know, you'll 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 have learned all the things that you've needed to learn in order to 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 be as effective uh, with people as as you can be. So again, um, just an honor to be here. A, a tremendous amount of potential, a tremendous amount of capacity that you have, um, and a tremendous amount of opportunity that I think if we can encourage you, if we can provide those experiences. Um, you'll be able to accomplish and manifest things that maybe you never even you never even thought possible, and certainly um, that's been the case. Uh, that's been the case for me. I uh, I accidentally became a bunch of things I didn't know existed, and uh, and because of that, I get to talk with people like you, and I get to meet people like Jesse. So it worked out. Well, thank you, Chris, and we've got a great audience for you who already has some spectacular questions. So if you're good with it, I can dive in with Q and A. Oh, we can have yeah. a conversation and. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I will say, I will say quickly, Jesse, that I, I did have the opportunity to speak with high school students in Waterloo, in uh, Winnipeg, and the questions that I was getting from high school students were, were fabulous, like so astute, so brilliant. So I'm just, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Well, I will take us straight to Central Peel Secondary School, Ms. Valley's group, uh, nine through twelve, is like a whole, uh, the, the whole group, frankly, at all the high school. Uh, so welcoming to all of you. They had a great question, which we had yesterday in a totally different context, but I love it as sort of an intro to the scientific process. Her students are wondering how to approach a research study of their own and what to think about when starting out along the way and dealing with the stress that you might have in doing so. That's a great question, right? These are these are the brilliant questions, right? So so research often starts with some type of idea. And and you know, sometimes it's the case that when we have an idea, we come become we, we become quite protective of it. We want to learn more about it, you want to um, maybe really think about how we can pursue it. One of the things that I've learned is that when you have an idea, it's good to talk uh, with other people who you who are also good minds, who are also, you know, people who you trust about your idea to say, you know, what do you think about this? Like, you know, do you have thoughts about it? Um, can you, do, are there things that I haven't really considered about this that, that you might have? And, and in that way, you know, you can really benefit from, from just the shared, um, the shared brilliance among that, that people have when they when they collaborate um that's one of the first things that i that i tend to do when you have an idea it's sort of like what do you think about this like is this is this something that 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 you think might be uh might be new or might be something that we need to do research on and um and in that way um you know i've always found that to be a very very good good place to start Sometimes when you have that conversation, then you, you 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 learn well. Okay, so in order to pursue this, there's a whole bunch of expertise that I'm going to need that I may have a uh, part of, but I may not have uh, other things. And in that way, again, uh, comes a stage where you begin asking other people who you know know how to do the things that you might not know how to do to partner together to come up with the plan as to how you're going to do it. Depending upon your research question, it might be relatively straightforward. You just need somebody who who kind of knows how to how to kind of you know get get questions written in a way that 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 people can answer or if you're doing something in a laboratory it might be that you need access to some type of equipment or some type of specialized knowledge on how to use that equipment so that 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 you can benefit and, and sort of find the answers you need um it can be it can be stressful i think the thing is is that at times and you'll you'll kind of learn this you know as as you go on is that it, there's a couple reasons why things are stressful. The first is is that it's really meaningful to you and you want to do well, right? And because of that, you know, you feel a lot of um, um, pressure to to really pursue it. It's it's something that, that means a lot to you. Sometimes stress comes from um, feeling as though maybe we've taken on a little more than we're able to do. And again, that's where collaborating and talking with people and, and seeking help, uh, you know, to do those things can can be really helpful. Sometimes stress comes from things that are entirely unrelated. Sometimes it comes from things that we're dealing with in our in our lives in some other way. Uh, in those ways, you know, making sure that you're engaging in those healthy activities that 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 um, we know are effective at at managing our own kind of stress level. So making sure you're getting enough sleep, making sure you're eating properly, making sure you're getting you know as 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 much as you're able to to uh, you know a reasonable amount amount of of opportunity for some physical movement during the day uh, and making sure that you've got your time structured. And when you begin to put all those things together, 
um, you begin to go through a process where you can kind of engage more fully in those things that you're interested in um, and uh, and really benefit from the knowledge that other people have as well. So that's a fantastic question. Yeah, It is a great starting question. And I've been, I was really excited for your first answer because of the work that you do. I figured it would be a very thoughtful answer and you didn't disappoint, Chris. That was spectacular. Nice. Um, I want to note it's really important to have someone who you're willing, who's willing to have you bounce ideas off them and who will tell you, you know, if it needs more structure or it needs to be simpler or grander. My wife says, have my ideas are terrible and i like that like that's really important we have that set up where it's like okay let's go through this and we heard this from bonnie yesterday as well like the idea of working with people that might have skills in completely different disciplines from you is so so important i think it's so integral to science so i love this as a question to kick us off so miss valley thank you for that yeah um, what one thing i'll say as well jesse and i was just listening to a podcast i don't know a couple weeks ago and it was a comedian and he was saying that he, he'll challenge himself to write a hundred jokes and only one of them might make it into the show, but he has to get all the bad ones out so that he can find the good ones. And sometimes ideas are like that as well. Like you, you bounce a lot of ideas and every now and then there's some ones that aren't that great. Um, but then you got some real, real kind of gems and, and those are the ones that you spend a little more time on. Yeah. You highlighted something in your answer that I really wanted to, uh, like it leads us beautifully into our next question. You talked yeah. about the fact of healthy habits helping alleviate stress and the work that you do can be stressful. I think we can all envision some of the work that you do being very challenging to deal with, to understand, to talk about. So the question was, how do you prioritize your own mental health when you're dealing with these stories that can be very, very challenging? And I'm really curious if there's anything you can share with us. Yeah. So, so that's, that's a really good question as well. And, and so, you know, you can break that question down to a number of different areas. One is personal practices, right? And so I talked about, um, you know, the, the, some of the four main things that that, that provide a foundation for general wellness. So that's that's making sure your days are structured. So that is, you know, you wake up each day and you've got something to do uh, and, and that that you've got a bit of a plan. Um, making sure that your sleep, you're getting as, as, as much uh, sleep as you need. And for, for young people in high school, that could be as many as 10 and 12 hours a day, right? Uh, or say eight, eight, eight to 12 hours a day. And, and that's that's quite a lot of the day. And, and one of the things I've seen, at least clinically, is that, you know, for the majority of people that I see, they're, they're getting nowhere near how much sleep they need. Yeah. The other thing is, is, uh, is again, making sure that, that you're, that you're in, in as, as far as you're able to, to get some physical activity each day. Maybe it's a walk. Uh, maybe it's uh, some other, some other uh, swimming, some other thing that you, that you really enjoy. Um, but also making sure that, it, uh, again, uh, in, insofar as you're able, that you're eating regularly and you're, you're doing okay. So those are the foundational pieces. Um, the other piece is uh, is those personal practices that you that you really find uh, rewarding, right? So for me, for example, I really like music. I, I played in rock and roll bands, you know, from from my teenage years all through to to, to when I was doing my PhD. I still uh, get together with some fellow fellows now and, and and jam. I did it on Sunday, so I play guitar in the evenings. I listen to records. I listen to music. You know, I kind of like I have you know in my basement a little area where there's a chair and a record player and I, I sit down there, you know, by myself and listen to records. Um, I, I also, you know, coach my son's hockey now. I, I, I help coach. So I get to, I, I played hockey growing up. So I get to go on the ice and get some physical activity and kind of have the fun of, of seeing a bunch of little ones sort of enjoy themselves and learn new things. So, you know, our ability to engage in all those extracurricular practices, they can wax and wane in life. And, I, and I'll, I'll be one to admit that, that I'm, I'm not always as effective as I can be when it comes to, um, prioritizing those things for myself. Um, and then when it comes to the actual content and things that we hear about from other people that can be challenging to hear, hear about, um, you know, we do get practice at that, uh, the longer, uh, sorry, during your clinical training, but as well as you become a clinician, you get practice at hearing things such that, um, that you, you begin to develop an ability to, uh, be in the moment and help other people through those situations uh, without necessarily taking on all of the uh, emotional feelings that the person all, is also experiencing them, right? So part of it is is, is practice. And, and, and sometimes what I say to my trainees is that, you know, your very first time as a practicing, as a, as a trainee clinician, it might be sort of, you're going to run a 5k, you're going to do a 10k fun run kind of thing, right? It's like a, a weekend challenge. And then once you've been a clinician for 10 years, you're sort of like that that ultra marathoner that's doing like the 200 miles and eating protein bars in the middle of the night, like those people that are, you know, and, and you can't, if, if you're just starting out in the 5k, you shouldn't try doing the, the ultra marathon. Right. And if you're the ultra marathoner, 
you have to recognize that everybody's in their own journey when it comes or at, the, at, at, the own, at their own point in the journey when it comes to it and really, really paying attention to what that is and making sure that uh, you're supporting people as they're, uh, as they're developing those skills and those abilities. Yeah. That's a fantastic answer. And you're the first person in 1,500 broadcasts who's mentioned a nice little record nook with a chair, which is one of the great joys in my life. So I kind of urge all our students to get one of those. You also hit up on something. It's so interesting. We don't do as many health programs as we do some of our other topics, but amidst all the gimmicks in healthcare, which there's a lot, you know, the essence of get exercise, eat well, sleep well, and have friends and do things in the community are the basis of, of Pretty much, you know, if you have those going for you, you have set yourself up really nicely, whether it's mental or physical health for decades to come. And I'm really glad you touched upon that for this answer. But just generally for our students, I think that's important to hear. So yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, um, but then one thing I'll add, Jesse, sorry, just quickly, is that there's always there always is that possibility that you have those things in place and there's still something that, that that's really troubling or really difficult for you. And in that way, that's that's when you 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 know it's important to access those other services or reach out to those other people who may be able to help with those other challenges, right? Um, you know, once you have the foundation piece in place, uh, that that takes care of a lot of you know general kind of mood challenges, general anxieties, and so on. But there is always those other things, and sometimes it's important to make sure you know the pathways to access those those other helps, those other support supports, and and and, and help when 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 you might need it. That's, uh, it leads me to a question I'm going to take in like two questions because it's a really important one that I want to get into this broadcast. Uh, but I want to head back to Central Park Second or Central Peel Secondary School, and we're going to blend this with another question we got online. Uh, so Ms. Bally's class wanted to know, were people accessing these and other mental health services before or after COVID? Like, how did that impact it? And the joint question is the opioid crisis. So these two sort of big things that have happened in the last few years, um, and we're really curious how they uh, have led to changes in your profession that you might be able to share with us. Yeah, I mean, so 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 the the COVID nineteen emergency was was really quite a challenge uh, and, and and really quite a an overwhelming experience for for a lot of people and and, and I say that knowing that you know it sounds like a, a massive understatement just to say that um, it was challenging for different people for different reasons right and so um, there's a whole there's a whole sort of underlying developmental piece that goes along with it so for example if you were just born, uh, and you were about a year old or so when the pandemic crisis was declared, and it meant that you couldn't go to daycare uh, because we were in the midst of those early lockdowns. Well, that also meant that perhaps you spent a lot of time with with your family, and maybe not didn't have as many opportunities to you know go to daycare, socialize with other children, um, learn from other adults, and so on. And so, so that can then sometimes that experience can lead to uh, kids that when the lockdowns were were lifted and you now had experiences with other people there was a bit of a lack of familiarity and even maybe some anxiety associated with that uh for other uh for other ages it may have been that there was a there was an intense and quick pivot to online learning in which case uh for those young people who really really thrive in in the social uh aspects of, of that, that that school has to offer that that the opportunity to engage with friends each day uh was no longer there uh, and that again affects you in a different way. For other people, uh, say if you're a physician or a nurse or a psychologist or another professional in some area, it may have been that there, there was overwhelming need, uh, and and that you know you were working really hard to kind of help help support people, uh, while at the same time uh, also being under you know similar stresses when it came to uh, just the uncertainty of everything. And so you know there is some data suggesting that. You know, at times during the lockdowns, we did see uh, different rates of, of anxiety, different rates of depressed, uh, uh, depressive type symptoms. Um, we have seen uh, that for different populations. One thing that I always think is really important to talk about is that, you know, despite all of that, um, young people are and can be and have a potential to be remarkably resilient. And so just as we need to pay attention to the things that are difficult, we also need to pay attention to the capacities and, and the abilities that people have to recover, the abilities that people um, uh, use to mitigate and offset the challenges that they may have been experiencing. Share those stories widely so that so that everyone kind of understands that there's 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 some shared experience here, but also there's shared skills and pathways that maybe we can learn to help us uh, through these experiences, and to really try to identify as much we can as much as we can. With, with adaptive aspects of ourselves, right? So we have those things that, that can be uh, at times challenges that we experience and, and rather than necessarily um, uh, 
focusing on those as being the key parts of our lives, although they're important, we also need to focus on our resilience and our strengths and our capacities as key parts of our lives as well and, and really kind of make sure our narratives are inclusive of you know, those things that we're also good at, not just those things that we may feel um, uh, are challenges to us or areas where we're not measuring up. Yeah. What a beautiful answer, Chris. This is fantastic, man. Um, professional detachment. Oh, no, I just love these answers. Uh, we're going to take a couple more questions before we wrap up. Class is on YouTube. Don't be shy. If you have any more, please do share. We got one written in uh, via email, and it was about the sort of shifting landscape of awareness on mental health issues generally. Like, I know when I was a boy, no one talked about mental health. If you had a mental health issue, you were crazy. You were denigrated for that. It was just simply not spoken. And there's been this tremendous change in that over my lifetime, especially the last, I would say, five years, where there's a recognition that most people have mental health challenges in their lives. Some of them can be quite serious. It's you know important to seek out help. There's no shame in doing so, or at least there's no, hopefully not meant to be any shame in doing so. So I'm really curious, as this transition has happened, how you found that influenced your, I mean, this is a huge question, but how has it influenced your practice or uh, anything you can share with us about the changing world of mental health awareness? Yeah, I think in general, uh, the fact that people are now more comfortable bringing those conversations forward uh, is, 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 a, is a net good thing, right? And so it used to be that, as you said, Jesse, those challenges were, were, were things that people experienced on their own. Um, it can be the case that depending upon, you know, where you live, depending upon your cultural background, depending upon, uh, you know, your means, uh, your experience uh, within family, that there still are places where uh, it's generally um, not talked about or it's generally, um, say, avoided or, or people may not feel as though there's, a, there's an environment where there's the opportunity to share those challenges that they're having, having. So I would say that the experience isn't, say, evenly distributed for everybody. There are those uh, communities uh, and and, and uh, uh, communities of young people uh, and, and and so on that that uh, still re remain um, in need of those outlets and those opportunities to be able to kind of talk about the challenges that they're experiencing. So that's one piece. And the other part I think that's changed a little bit for me uh, more recently, and it, it's sort of related to the, the last answer is again, you know, part of part of being a young person is also in finding yourself and also in developing your identity and developing kind of who you are and, and knowing and, and knowing sort of about yourself and, and what your what your goals are and what you'd like to do. Um, and I am seeing sometimes, um, you know, circumstances where young people, again, are really seeking that um, in terms of the things that aren't going well in their lives uh, and, and, and sort of finding identity in, 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 in the things that, uh, the, say, the weaknesses rather than the strengths. And so, you know, my hope is clinically that we really try to balance that out. It's important to know those aspects, right? So if you feel as though you have a mental health difficulty and anxiety or depression or, or some other area, I mean, that's, that's an important part uh, that we need to pay attention to and talk about. But that's not the only thing you are, right? Uh, in addition to, say, being somebody who's experienced challenges and who's now trying to find their way through uh, through those difficulties. Um, again, as I said earlier, you're, you're also people, you're also someone with tremendous capacity and ability and potential. And, and even at times, if it doesn't feel like it, we really want to pay attention to those strengths, those res the, the resilience, uh, those, those things that you're able to do to make sure there's balance in how we understand ourselves. We're not, we're not all one thing or all another thing. We're, 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 a, we're complex people with a range of experiences, internal capacities, but also internal liabilities. That in some times, that that in, in some contexts, um, uh, we we can really find our, our ourselves kind of thriving. In other contexts, we can find ourselves experiencing difficulty. But really, what we're seeking is balance in in, in understanding that about ourselves. Yeah. Thank you very very much, Chris. Um, I know we could go all day with questions. Time flies and you're having fun. So we're nearing the end of the broadcast, and I want to finish with the uh, last one written in. And I love when we get questions on this theme. So you talked about sort of uneven distribution of awareness for this or, or you know everything in our last question and it leads me to you do such amazing work with your local community how do you share that work with other people do you get the chance to i mean you talk about talking with high school students do you get to share the research that you do and the outcomes in a positive way with other communities across canada internationally i always like when we get variations in this because it highlights the sort of collaborative yeah. nature of science so please do share yeah no i mean opportunities like this are really really important because it 
So when I was in high school, I didn't know about research and I didn't know about researchers and I didn't know about university professors. And I didn't know about pathways to the things that you might become, right? I, I talked about that before. So this is very, very important. This, this provides opportunities for us to talk about, uh, you know, research work that we're doing that, that, that young people might be interested in, because as I said before, you're going to be the ones that, that, uh, that carry all this forward in some way, right? It's, it, I'm going to retire at some point um, and we need you. And so this is a great opportunity. Um, I've been really fortunate. I, I'm, I'm often invited into communities, into organizations uh, to talk about, say, clinical skills, uh, talk about research, and I and I try my best to accommodate every one of those requests. Now, sometimes I'm 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 unable to accommodate it, but it's usually because I'm booked speaking to somebody else at that time. So, so I really believe strongly in the importance of dissemination. I really believe strongly that. You know, research knowledge and, and psychological knowledge and clinical knowledge um, ought to be available to people uh, if they if they're curious about it. it. It's 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 it should be in the public domain. People should have the opportunity to engage with researchers um, to to learn about things. Um, that's really important. As well, you know, there's traditional uh, academic outlets by which we uh, we share our ideas so that they're available uh, for other people to search and learn about. Right. So that might be through giving talks at conferences, it might be through publishing articles in um, in academic journals or in, in other reports that we then post uh, or, or make available online so that people can um, find the information. At the end of the day, I, I believe strongly when we're learning new things, when we're we're building a, a broader understanding of the world around us, we need to make uh, we need to make those findings available to people so that other people can read them and think about them and, and carry the ideas, uh, the, the ideas for, further for the, for the benefit of everybody. And so I try to engage in as many different kind of modalities of that uh, as possible. Um, and, uh, and again, it's a, it's a massive honor and privilege to be, to, to, to be able to do so. Well, we certainly are thrilled that you took the time to join us for one of these uh, talks of yours. And I know you've got more uh, upcoming in the days to come. So a, a huge, tremendous thank you for joining us as part of this Gardner series. As I opened uh, this program with, we've been doing a, a sort of uh, amazing series again with the Gardner laureates and people in, associated with them. Uh, this is program two of seven in the next few weeks. So we're really excited to get to do a lot of uh incredible talks. If you want to find out more about Dr. Mosbosch's work, uh, you've got a very easy URL on your website, which is fantastic. So people can find it about some of the work that you do, your lab mates, the awards and uh, work that your team has done. So thank you more than you know. Uh, we'll say farewell to our classes for now, but we really appreciate the chance to chat with you today and keep up the amazing work, man. <laughs> Thanks so much for the opportunity. I really, really appreciate it.